Okay, now we move along. Huh? Let me ask you, what do you think about this model? Do you like that? Not really? Okay, me personally, I don't like that. Well, and what is the main criticism of this model? Just think to yourself, apply realistic thinking. Okay, well, I think to myself, um, there is, I am a monopolist, there is a guy who comes to the market, and then what I do is that, okay, I have, I keep the same output level, and I just take a new price, and that's it. Mm -hmm. I would so I would say quite passive monopolist. Mm -hmm. It's not quite reasonable. It looks like the monopolist would do something when the entry occurs. Mm -hmm. And first of all, what it can do, it can try to reduce the output. Huh? Just look at this. Um, here in the previous model we decided that uh, the Q production level of monopolist was 30. Mm -hmm. The newcomer produced 10, that the price on the market was 60. Mm -hmm. It was like that. But then we can think the following. What if we drop this assumption that the output level of the monopolist will, will be kept constant? Mm -hmm. What if we think that monopolist can respond to entry? Mm -hmm. Here we understand that if the price, the demand function is 100 minus Q, now the monopolist understands that there is already 10 units on the market. Now we can think about the residual demand function for a monopolist, just in the same way as we did deriving this 10. Mm -hmm. From here, we get this, that a new demand function that will be faced by the monopolist is 100 minus this 10 and minus Q of monopolist. Now it has a little bit different profit maximizing uh, problem. Here we have 90 minus QM. Now we apply twice a steep rule. Marginal revenue of monopolist is equal to 90 minus 2QM and is equal to 40. Hmm? Average costs, uh, marginal costs. No, 40. Oh, yeah, Q. Q so you are so fast. <laughs> Faster than me. This is 45. Mm -hmm. And then in order to, to find the price on the market, we take P is equal to 100 minus this 45. OK, you know what? It's not 45. This is 25. <laughs> 90 minus 40 is 50. To 2 is 25. Huh? So this will be 100 minus 25 minus 10. And then we get the market price equal to 65. Mm -hmm. So in, in this case, what will be my profit? My profit is 65, the profit of monopolist is 65 minus 40 and 225. Uh, 25625. Mm -hmm. So at least it is higher than this 600 that we got uh, in the previous model. Mm -hmm. Or we can act in an alternative way. We can say, but what if I expand the uh, output? Mm -hmm. Here I reduce that. What if I expand? Say, I can apply actually just the same logic, but not to deter entry, but to respond to entry. Why not? Say, the guy has come to the market, and now suddenly I drop the price. I say, no. Now I set it, say, 49.95 yeah? and this guy he has to go out of market just because now it is not profitable to operate anymore mm -hmm. and say I'm monopolist I say now I take the 
I put the price equal to um, price of monopolist is 49.95. Mm -hmm. In this way, I get the whole demand just to myself again, mm -hmm. because the entrant will stop operating. So I will produce my Q of monopolist. Okay, we will say that we produce not machines, but kilos of sugar. Mm -hmm. So we can have something with decimals. This will be 50.5 kilo, million of kilo of sugar, say. Mm -hmm. So this is something like P is equal almost 50, but with min minus some epsilon. Epsilon is always some marginal amount, say one cent, two cents, something like that. In this case, my profit will be, say this will be 50 minus epsilon, minus my average costs, and multiplied by the Q. Mm -hmm. And this will be, this is 500 uh, minus some epsilon. So what happens in this case? Look, is that either to reduce the output or to increase the output is always better than to sustain the same mm, if the entry occurs. So this is the main criticism of this model, that something is intuitively wrong with the assumptions. Yeah? We have to relax one assumption, and then the model suddenly makes considerably more sense. Mm -hmm. So this model, how can the monopolist ascertain the cost of the entrant in processing the price? OK, again, this is the assumption of the model, that for some reasons he can. <laughs> yeah. But OK, well, um, what is the model itself? Uh, the good model is not the one that explains the reality. A good model is the one that gives you a tool to understand, to analyze something. Yeah? Because if you try to build a model that includes everything, yeah, all absent information, it becomes so complicated and it becomes so specific to a particular case that it loses its, its prediction force at all. Yeah? It was a famous scientist, a Nobel Prize winner in economics from Norway, Trygve Hovelmo, who used to say the following. It is very, very simple to come up with a complicated model that explains this complicated world. It is very difficult to come up with a simple model that will explain complicated world. Mm -hmm. So you see. So sometimes even these simple things with quite strict assumptions make sense, mm -hmm. just because it gives us an analytical tool. Even if you think about the previous uh, example from chapter 10, this cartel, the model itself is very fairly simple. Yeah? We have a price leader who has an incentive to sustain cooperation on the market. And therefore, on its own expenses, he reduces his output just to keep the price on. That's it. This is the whole model, huh? nothing else. Uh, but it explains quite a lot, the, well, almost all the history of OPEC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, but you can earn money at least now. So in the long run, you maximize the profit. Because now you earn, and then it, it reduces. But you have a time dimension in this. yeah. And then if you sum up everything, you'll be better off. Look at this example. Say, I can uh, cut the price to deter entry. Mm -hmm. So it means that from the very beginning, I earn this 500 and nothing more. Mm -hmm. Or I can say, well, I will wait until the entry occurs. But until this entry occurs, I earn the profit, a normal big profit, this 900. Mm -hmm. for, for example, each month I earn uh, 900. And then the entry occurs. And in response to entry, I cut the price. Mm -hmm. And from now on, I earn only 500. But it was at least like one or two years when I earned a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So and then in the summation, in the long run, I actually increase my profit by uh, not implying this limit price in strategy mm -hmm. in the beginning. You see my point? Mm -hmm. Well, 
in this model, the main assumption was that the monopolist had a cost advantage. Mm -hmm. Marginal cost, no average cost of a monopolist was 40, while the cost of potential entrant was 50. Mm -hmm. What will happen if there are no patent, nothing like that, no intellectual property rights or whatsoever, and that we consider some simple production when everybody can do that, say, for the same cost. Mm -hmm. Now we consider the alternative model when I have the same cost structure. Um, the first step would be to consider the case. Okay, well, I have um, average cost of monopolist equal to marginal cost of monopolist, and this equal to 40, and the same for potential entrant. <coughs> Who can tell me what will be the limit price according to this model? So the limit price is such a price that makes the production for my opponent unprofitable. Mm -hmm. So it keeps him, keeps him out of the market. Don't look at that. Not now. <laughs> Just look at this. So according to the previous model, we should say that it is 40. Mm -hmm. So if I set the price equal to 40, then the potential entrant has no incentives to enter the market. But the problem is that I do not have them as well. Mm -hmm anymore. So my economic profit is zero then. So it looks like if there is no cost advantage, then this limit pricing strategy will not work. But this is not quite the case. Because in this case, we assume that we have, like here, linear cost functions. Mm -hmm. So there is no any economy of scale. So if I produce five units of something, it costs me uh, fifty dollars. Mm -hmm. If I produce ten units of something, it costs me one hundred dollars. Just linear, yeah? always the same. Now we make an assumption. So to say, we make the model a little bit more realistic. We assume that there is some economy of scale, and this is quite reasonable thing. For example, uh, we understand that we have to pay some fixed cost for warehouse. It's just a big building. You have to pay for electricity, um, for rent of this warehouse, and so on. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how uh, much stuff is lying there. Mm -hmm. If there is m more, then um, the average cost is less. Mm -hmm. As simple as that. So with this economy of scale, we have different cost structure. Now we have this story with concave functions. Mm -hmm. And as long as we talk about economy of scale, we switch attention to long run costs. Mm -hmm. Not short term, but long run. Um, on this graph, just to make sure from the beginning, it is stated in the book that all these numbers, they come from nowhere. Mm -hmm. That's why it makes this model a little bit too complicated, I think. Because there is no equations that can um, describe these two curves. Mm -hmm. So we have only the equation to the demand function. It is said that in this case we have <laughs> demand function on the market that is equal to 100 minus 1.25 Q. Mm -hmm. um, about the behavior of these costs, we have only, only this data that say if the quantity is 18, then average cost is here, and, and so on. Yeah? So this is all information that we have. Um, and now we assume that there is a monopolist, and uh, he wants to maximize his profit. The logic is just the same. We apply marginal revenue equal to marginal cost rule, and marginal revenue we derived again from, from the uh, demand function. It will be tri twice as steep rule. It will be 100 minus 2.5q. Mm -hmm. This is this line. 
And now we equate that to marginal costs. So we find the point where marginal revenue intersects long run marginal costs. This is this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, Q is equal to 34. Then from this point, we go up to the demand function mm -hmm. and find the price. So we say that if monopolist is only one on the market, we have the Q of monopolist equal to 34 and the price of monopolist equal to 57.5. OK, who can tell me what would be the profit? How can I find the profit of uh, monopolist on this graph? Mm, guys, you're so clever. In order to understand what is their long run profit, we have to find the average cost, yeah? the cost of producing one unit. And this is this, mm -hmm. Th this intersection. So everything that goes from here to here, all this block, is the profit of the firm. Mm -hmm. So you see. Um, we can calculate from this data the profit of the monopolist. Mm -hmm. So we have to find the average costs. We can look at this table. So if the quantity is 34, the average cost is 20. Mm -hmm. So it looks like that. The profit is equal to price minus long run average costs multiplied by Q. Mm -hmm. So this will be 57.5 minus this 20 and multiplied by 34. Mm -hmm. And believe me, it is equal to 1275. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens next? We apply the same reasoning as before. A potential enter uh, comes to the market. What we should do here is that we cut this part of the month curve, because this 34 is already produced. Mm -hmm. So the new guy, he faces a new demand. Mm -hmm. And this demand will be but demand for potential entrant is equal to 100 minus uh, this price. Uh, no, OK. Yeah, uh, 100 minus Q produced, um, 100, 125 Q produced by the monopolist and minus 125Q produced by himself. Mm -hmm. This is equal to 34 multiplied by 125, and then we get 57.5 minus 125Q. Mm -hmm. um, what will happen in this case? is that in this residual, uh, residual demand curve, there is a, uh, some part of average cost curve that lies below the demand. Mm -hmm. So it means that for, for the new entrant, if he produces any amount from Q1 to Q2 here, he has economic profit. Mm -hmm. Just because this is the cost of producing one unit, and it goes it lies below the price. Mm -hmm. So everything here will be his profit. Mm -hmm. So it means that he has an incentive to enter the market and to produce some amount between these two. Um, then the question is, what is the limit price in this case? Mm -hmm. How can we find a price that will deter the entry? The logic is the same. We have to find such a price that will shift the demand curve or make the residual demand curve to lie everywhere below the average cost curve. Mm -hmm. So, and if we set the price equal to 40, then this residual demand curve will lie always below. So it is only tangent to this curve. Say, if he produces 10, he will earn uh, zero economic profit. Mm -hmm. So he, ha he will just cover the costs. Um, 
what is the outcome then? That say if my monopolist sets the price equal to 40 minus some epsilon. So just marginally below, it will deter the entry. And if we come back to this graph, we see that, well, if the price is 40 here, the monopolist will still earn quite a lot, a lot of profit. Because this will be this point. Yeah? Uh, I guess this is 22. Mm -hmm. So this amount will be his profit still. Mm -hmm. uh, but the potential entrant will earn only zero. Mm -hmm. So it looks that uh, if we have a case without any economy of scale, with the linear cost structure, mm -hmm. then this uh, limit pricing strategy does not work. Mm -hmm. But if there is some economy of scale and we have some curvature uh, with the cost structure, then it can be applied. Mm -hmm. Because we can still find some price that will still bring the profit to monopolist, but will deter the entry. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Oi. Well, I don't actually find that. What we do here, as I told you, uh, these numbers with these costs, they are just arbitrary. So we don't have any equation to describe this. What we do, we simply take this residual demand curve and push it down mm -hmm. until some time, until the point when it is only tangent. <laughs> OK, this is the author of the book who decided it will be 40. That's it. <laughs> That's why I told you in the beginning <laughs> that the model is quite strange. We were it's just maybe you are going to ask this in exam. <laughs> <laughs> well, and now we start the, mo the funniest part of this model, m my favorite, is that uh, this model was really heavily criticized by game theorists. Just probably for the same reasons as you say. OK, what is going on, actually? Yeah? Um, and the main criticism, again, comes from the following thing. Why should we assume that the monopolist we sus will sustain the same level of output? Mm -hmm. This is a game, actually, between two players. Mm -hmm. You come, and I respond somehow. Mm -hmm. This is how the whole thing should work. Um, and here we have a game tree. Mm -hmm. Say this is a potential entrant. He decides whether to uh, enter the market or stay out. And there are two strategies for a monopolist. Either to follow the short-term profit maximization and to applies this thinking mm -hmm. just to maximize the pro uh, profit right now or to uh, utilize this limit pricing strategy mm -hmm. to deter the entry. Well, what happens in this case? So in order to analyze the game, of course, we have to find the outcomes yeah? to understand who does what. Here we calculated that if uh, the monopolist just um, maximizes his profit, he gets 1,275, and the entrant stays out. So the entrant earns zero, and this earns positive profit. Uh, what happens if the potential entrant stays out, but the monopolist decides to limit the price just for the case? Mm -hmm. What will happen then? We have to uh, calculate that. Mm -hmm. So um, we look at this graph. It turns out that uh, we decided that if the price is 40, then the guy will stay out from the market. But with, with this 40, we can find the output. Mm -hmm. This will be if the cost function, uh, demand function is 100 minus 125Q, mm -hmm. then it will be um, 125Q 
is equal to 100 minus 40. Uh -huh. So uh, Q is equal to 48. Uh -huh. And then we can calculate the profit. So if Q is 48, look here, then uh, average cost is equal to 22. Uh -huh. Then profit, I put this limit price and I put L here, huh? will be 48, price is 40 minus some epsilon, because we decided that it will be 40 minus something, mm -hmm. and minus average cost, minus 22. Mm -hmm. And this will give us is 864 minus epsilon. Mm -hmm. Then what is next? What happens if the potential enter decides that I will enter the market? The game theorist says the following, that there will be no story about residual demand curve at all. Mm -hmm. The two guys will simply share the market. And that they will face half of demand each. Mm -hmm. And to my understanding, this is considerably more reasonable. Mm -hmm. Because say, if I'm a customer um, and I see two identical products, I will not think to myself, OK, I should buy the product of the monopolist until it is on the shelf. And only after that, I will buy the product of the entrant. It does not work like that. Yeah? I just go and take the first. That's it. And so we can say that reasonably to assume that they will just split. Uh, if they split the market. So uh, my demand for each of the firms, say for monopolist and for the potential entrant, will be 100 minus 2.5 Q. Uh, come back to this graph. Look, it is depicted actually here. Mm -hmm. OK, this was marginal revenue for the monopolist. But now we say, OK, look here. Here he, he shows the marginal revenue for demand equal to this one. So this is the new case. Now we have two firms. They share the market. And they face different or new demand curves. And these new demand curves, they are twice as steep. So this is my new demand curve for both companies. Mm -hmm. And then, in order to um, maximize the profit, I apply twice as steep rule. So for both of them, say to monopolist, will be equal to marginal revenue of potential entrant. It is equal to 100 minus 5Q. Mm -hmm. Um, then I have to go back to to this and to, to find, okay, well, if this is my new marginal revenue, I have to find the crossing with marginal cost. cost. And this point is here. It is 18. Again, I take these numbers just from the graph. So my new profit maximizing Q is equal to both firms. And it is equal to 18. Mm -hmm. For quantity equal to 18, I have average cost equal to 25. Long run average cost is equal to 25. And then I find profits for both of them. This is equal to 18. Um, the price now. Uh -huh. What is the price now? The price now is 55, right. Yeah. So we take this point, go up to the new demand curve, that this is this one, and we have a price 55. Will be 55 minus 25, and we get 540. Profit for each of them. 
Um, yeah. What happens if the potential enter uh, decides to enter the market and the monopolist exercises the, the limit prices behavior? What happens then? Uh, now we think to ourselves, okay, he decided to produce, to, to keep the price this 40 minus epsilon. For him, uh, the amount that he will produce will be um, 48. Yeah? We found that on the graph. But then another guy, the potential entrant, he still enters and he produces only these 10 units. Yeah? We saw this on this graph, that this is tangent and he is still, so he entered. So he wants to produce at least this 10. Um, so this is Q. Then this Q potential entrant, he produces 10. So the total production on the market will be 58. Mm -hmm. And then the price will be 100 minus 58. And this is 42. Mm -hmm. And then from here, we can cal calculate a new profit of um, of the monopolist. This will be 48 multiplied by, see, look here. Oh, no, I'm, I'm making a mistake. This. One hundred min minus one point twenty five multiplied by fifty eight, and the the result will be twenty seven point five. Huh? And then the price is twenty seven point five. The cost is twenty two, and then my profit will be two sixty four minus this sum epsilon this one. Mm -hmm. So now we have a new game three. Uh, these are four outcomes. How do we usually analyze the games that are presented in the extensive form? Mm -hmm. What is the way of thinking, guys? Backward, Backward induction. induction, right. So look here. Now we put on shoes of the monopolist. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we look only on this second part of the brackets. So the monopolist now decides which strategy to, to utilize if he ends up in this decision node. Mm -hmm. um, five, uh, 540 is larger than this, for sure. Yeah? Therefore, I say, OK, no limit price strategy. I just maximize the profit. Now I go, go up. What is here? Again. Uh, monopolist ends up in this decision node and he has to decide whether to maximize the profit or limit the price. Again, we look at the second part and it looks that he is better off just by profit maximizing. So now we move to this decision node. Potential enter has only one and he has to decide whether to stay out or to enter. But he knows that the monopolist for sure will play this strategy if he enters and he will play this strategy if he stays out. Therefore, when he decides between these two actions, he only considers these two outcomes. Mm -hmm. So now he looks at 0 and 500.40. And of course, he is better off by playing this strategy. Mm -hmm. So say, what is The Nash equilibrium. To enter and to maximize the profit. Yeah? So, and it actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, so, game theorists would always say that all this story about limit pricing um, strategies doesn't make any sense. Because the analysis of game shows the following that 
the potential enter would always enter the market and the monopolist will always accommodate mm -hmm. um, and now this will be a little bit of technical game theory we should understand the difference between the normal form game and the extens extensive form game so normal form game is always something that we look at the table mm -hmm. the extensive form game this is always about the tree mm -hmm. uh, the thing is that each extensive form game can be represented in the normal form mm -hmm. but not other way around for example if you look at the prisoner's dilemma game you remember this first table that I wrote can you imagine how can we build a game tree? Uh, well, the thing is that in the prisoner's dilemma game, we have a one-shot game. Both players make their decision simultaneously, mm -hmm. right now. But when we talk about game trees, we always introduce uh, some sequence in decisions. Mm -hmm. I move first, you move second. Therefore, not every normal form game can be represented as an extensive form game. But it always works the other way around. And this is the normal form representation of the game tree. Um, but look, we have only two players. Each of them has only two strategies. Mm -hmm. So it should be game two by two. What we have here? Four strategies for monopolist, two strategies for potential entrant. Mm -hmm. Something is not okay. For understand why it is so, we have to uh, come back to the definition of uh, Nash equilibrium. What is this? This is such a strategy profile that uh, will give us the case when none of the players have an incentive to change the strategy. So you see that I talk about strategies, not the actions. What is the action? Action that is a move in the game that I make in each of the decision nodes. Mm -hmm. The strategy is a specification of actions in each of the decision nodes. You see the difference? So a strategy is not just some action. It's not that I move here. But this is a specification of what I should do in each of the decision nodes. You can think of it in the following way. Say, um, you play this game and you are a monopolist but for some reasons you cannot be um, there when the uh, game actually occurs so you send your friend and uh, to your friend you make a note you tell him what to do in each of the cases mm -hmm. so you tell to him okay if you are in the decision node one you go profit maximizing if you are in a decision node two you go limit price. Mm -hmm. So, and then this specification of actions in each of the nodes will comprise a strategy. Mm -hmm. Therefore, in this table, we talk about strategies. Look, monopolist has two decision nodes, M1 and M2. Therefore, each strategy should specify what to do in each of the nodes, even though this um, node will not be reached in the game. Say here, if I say that if you wait, if you are in a decision node one, you have to play profit maximizing. Uh, it's already crazy to see anything about node two, because if I'm here that I'm not playing and it doesn't make sense. But technically, to solve the problem um, with the framework of game theory, we have to be very correct in specifying what is the strategy. Um, so, in order to build a normal form game, I have to list all the strategies available to each of the players. Player 2, or potential entrant, has only one decision node. Mm -hmm. Therefore, his strategies will contain only one action. Uh, so, we have only two strategies, to stay out or to enter. In the case of Monopolist, two decision nodes mm -hmm. and two strategies. So we have to find 
all permutations. So profit maximization, profit maximization in both decision nodes. Here, profit maximization or limit pricing in the second. Then other way around and both L. So we have to specify all, uh, all possible ways. Is it clear how it comes up here? Mm -hmm. And then we find Nash equilibrium. Let me find it here. Say this will be PP, PL, LP, and L, L. Here, yes, stay out and enter. Come back to the tree in order to fill the um, game outcome. Say, what if potential enter stays out, I play, or monopolist plays profit maximization. So if he stays out, then the second decision node is not relevant. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I look, what is my specification of actions for decision node one? This is profit maximizing. Uh, therefore, I write here 0, 1275. Mm -hmm. What if he stays out, monopolist plays profit maximization and limit price in decision node 2? What should I write here? Good. Here, stays out, limit pricing in decision node 1 and profit maximization in decision node 2. What I write here? So this is my action in decision node 1. This is my action in decision node 2. Hmm? If the potential enter decides to stay out, it means that uh, decision node 2 is not relevant. I don't consider what is written here. I only look here. So potential enter stays out, the monopolist exercises limit pricing. Mm -hmm. What I should write here? You guys tell me. Just the same. Uh, the next thing. The potential enter, he decides to enter. Therefore, the action at decision node 1 is not relevant anymore. Mm -hmm. Now I look only what the monopolist decides in decision node 2. So enter profit maximization. 540, 540. Mm -hmm. He enters, uh, the enter enters, and then the monopolist exercises limit pricing. What I write here? Mm -hmm. Minus epsilon. Right. In this case, enters profit maximizing. And again, loss. Like six, four, minus four. So in now we have got the normal full representation of this decision tree. Mm -hmm. The next step that we, okay, well, now we have, mm -hmm. You mean what is this? Yeah. I think it's wrong. I think no. No, look. This is my action in decision node one. This is my action in decision node two. So if my opponent stays out, I'm here. And this guy tell me, the monopolist, that I should play profit maximization if I'm a decision node M1. I go this way. What is wrong? So uh, limit pricing is relevant for decision node 2. But if potential enter stays out, this decision node is not relevant. Mm -hmm. Therefore, this is the outcome. Is it convincing? Why not? But in any case, we are uh, yeah. choosing the profit maximizing. Is it no? No matter what 
matter what the potential interest is doing, we are uh, choosing the profits maximizing y and return. Okay. Okay, we know that because we have applied backward induction thinking. Hmm? So we already actually have solved the exercise. Mm -hmm. And now I only tell you how we can reason about that in a different way. In game theory, we have two type of games. Game trees and normal form games. Mm -hmm. For normal form games, we use Nash equilibrium concept. For extensive form game, we use backward induction. So, uh, and this is something called subgame perfect equilibrium. So you see, this is two different equilibrium concepts. Mm -hmm. For the game, we use subgame perfect. For the normal form game, we use Nash equilibrium. This is the thing. We already applied backward induction thinking to this extensive form game, and now I want to tell you what is actually the difference between these two equilibrium concepts. I show you how to represent this game tree in the form of normal form game, in the form of table. And then if I have a table, I apply not a subgame perfect equilibrium. I apply a Nash equilibrium. This is the point. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to get back to that in 15 minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm.